I want to get this uh, webinar started. My name is Tim Cole, and I'm the uh, director at Waypoint Church Partners, and uh, we are doing a 35-minute webinar at most, maybe a little quicker, uh, talking about the CARES Act and the payroll protection plan program that, that came out just a week and a half ago, like 10 days ago is when it became uh, signed into law. And so most of you are on this uh, webinar today because you know that it has just come together very quickly and there's lots of questions and misinformation being uh, thrown about swirling around and so we've invited Tim Stevens from uh, one of our good ministry partners in the region CFR Christian Financial Resources to join us today he is the representative at CFR that's trying to keep on top of the information and uh, CFR serves churches all, all around the region like we do uh, at Waypoint uh, we often say that one of our primary tasks uh, is that we are navigating ministry together, that we at Waypoint are trying to help churches and leaders through all the twists and turns of ministry. And boy, in the last month, uh, we have a, had a big twist or a big turn or both with this coronavirus and how it has changed our culture and the church and uh, now even this, this uh, financing for payroll protection. And uh, so we are glad that you are with us today on this webinar, and we are gonna have uh, time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. If we don't get to your question or answer or question to answer it, uh, we will follow up via email to try and answer everyone's question. As always, we wanna thank our sponsor for our webinar platform, Mid-Atlantic Christian University, another ministry partner that serves churches and leaders all across the country, but specifically here in the Mid-Atlantic region. And so they are, they are this, the long time uh, exclusive uh, sponsor of our webinar platform. And so we're thankful for our partnership with them. And uh, so we're thankful that uh, Tim Stevens is here to join us uh, today. And Tim and I have known each other. Tim, I was thinking back, uh, we met a little over 20 years ago. I remember you visited, you were part of a church plant in Florida and came and visited our church plant in Virginia Beach. I remember you came and visited my small group on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, that day was the first time we met. So, uh, yep. so it's been- I remember that, Tim, that's crazy. And uh, so it's good um, to have you on the call today. And so I just want to uh, throw things open, but, at the, but I also want to tell people, if you're new to the Zoom platform, which there are a lot of people that have become experts in Zoom in the last 10 days or two weeks, uh, but um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you have a question, please don't wait until the end to ask your question. As soon as you think of the question, go ahead and type it in so you don't forget it, number one. And number two, so it goes in the queue that we can see so that we know what we can answer live that will apply to the most people. And if your question might be only for a few specific people, we might wait on that one until after the call. We will also send out a follow-up email to all the people that are on the, the uh, video today, the webinar, uh, with some links that we're going to describe here today. So in case you don't have the links, we'll make sure that you get them here later this afternoon. So, uh, so thanks for joining us. And, uh, and Tim, so if you just want to jump in and kind of tell us your thoughts about the origin of the, of the CARES Act and the, and the payroll protection plan and all that, and then specifically, what are churches supposed to do today? And I think your answer today would, will be different than even what we knew on Friday uh, yeah. in some way. And so things have really evolved just over the weekend. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. So, guys, I want to tell you, I've, I've been researching this and looking at it a lot. I'm not an expert, but I have read a lot. And I do think there is less gray area now than there was certainly a week ago even four or five days ago. Since Friday afternoon at probably two or three, it seems like for the most part, the information is, um, has not changed too much. It's still fairly consistent with what it was Friday afternoon. So I feel like we're getting to a place where we can um, speak about it intelligently, more intelligently than we did a week ago. Um, I wanna kind of tell you what my plan is. Tim had asked to try to be done by 1.35. So my plan is to talk no more than 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. And that'll give us plenty of time for Q&A because I've got to believe that by now, most of you are at least familiar with this legislation. So it's not the first time you've heard about it. If it is, I think you'll still within 10 minutes kind of get your arms around it. But within 10 or 15 minutes, you will have at least heard everything I've said. And then we can take your questions. Hopefully we can get through as many questions as possible. I want to let you know, this again, doesn't mean I'm an expert, but the reason I started looking at this quickly and before the PPP, understand there's two forms of this legislation, two, two kind of basic loans. There's an EIDL 
uh, emergency, I forget the I, disaster loan. And that kind of came out first. And that was out for small businesses and no idea churches were even going to be a part of that. That came out around March 12th or 13th, um, primarily for the Northeast, Washington and California. So I actually know some small business owners that have gotten loans already of over $100,000, over $200,000 that uh, applied for those pretty quickly. In Georgia, where I live, they opened it up March 17th. Well, I was in Lake Mary, Florida in our corporate office. And my wife is like, my wife owns her own business. She's like, hey, they opened it up for Georgia. I'm going to go and start applying. Long story short, the website just kept crashing, crashing, crashing. But on March 18th, the, um, a church that we have a, a loan with at CFR that we work with down in St. Petersburg was on the, was on the call with one of their, their elders. And he was, was actually, it made me tear up. He said, man, I want to I wanna help some of these churches having a hard time. I just realized our church is gonna have a hard time making their payments. So I gave some extra money and said, but we have some money on account at CFR and I wanna help. I wanna give $15,000 to churches that aren't gonna be able to make their April 1st payment. And so it was a really cool call and teared up and I didn't even know this guy. We well, calls back the next day and he's excited. And he says, hey, my preacher just got off this call. You need to talk to him. He said that the government's gonna pay all our expenses for two months. And I was like, that didn't happen. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I've been around long enough to know the government's not paying two months worth of church expenses. So that being said, I called his preacher and he's like, no, I was just on a call with 500 church leaders around Florida and Marco Rubio kind of led the call and walked us through it. And it's going to be part of this. He didn't get the term that, you know, he didn't call it, what, but it's basically his payroll protection act and they're going to pay our expenses for eight weeks. And and it sounded, again, too good to be true. Um, some of you guys might know a name named Todd Wilson. He, is, uh, he leads the Exponential Conference. And so I started texting him and said, hey, man, have you heard anything about this? Just so you know, I've known Todd for about the same number I've known Tim, maybe a year longer. But how I really got to know Todd was when we started the church in Tampa, Florida, Todd's brother was the president of, of the uh, Tampa Chamber of Commerce. He's a young guy in his late 20s. He and his wife started coming to our church, and we baptized both he and his wife there. Well, Mark has continued to move up the ladder. Now he's president of the Florida Chamber of Commerce and has a pretty good relationship, a personal relationship with Marco Rubio. So I started texting, and basically he's like, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to happen. The money's there. It's for small businesses. It's also for churches, and it's going to happen. And I was like, well, I heard Steve Mnuchin say, it, you know, these small businesses are going to be able to get the money next week this was two weeks ago and he's like yeah that's probably not going to happen the the timing might not happen but the money is going to be there and it's going to be available for not only for-profit businesses but also not-for-profits including churches so it kind of gave me hope and since then really since march 17th uh, or since the 19th that call is on march 19th i've been reading everything i could learning everything i can and uh, just so you know so my wife owns that small business we've still been trying to get this disaster loan She's applied, but we actually were the first one at our little community bank where she, uh, she banks. We were the first one in line Friday morning. They got our PPP loan into the SBA and we got approved this morning. So we already know that we've been approved for a a decent amount of money. So I, I can tell you it is real and it's happening. And just know that the two people that primarily wrote this legislation, because they have a heart for small businesses and entrepreneurs, but they also happen to be really godly Christian men. I, I shouldn't say I, by reputation and by everything they say, our uh, Senator Marco Rubio of Florida and Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, and they absolutely want churches in on this. So all that being said, this is primarily for small businesses, but churches are absolutely being considered small businesses and other 501c3s, religious, uh, not just Christian, any religious not-for-profit, not and so they want to help uh, churches get this. So with that being said, I want to kind of pull up the link, uh, Tim, if you can show them the link to the PPP. I'm going to try to walk through it. Tim, I know we're not taking questions for another 10 minutes or so, but if you can still interrupt me if you, if you have any questions or if you think I need to, you know, uh, be, clarify something that, that maybe is yeah. a little unclear. I'm going to try yeah. to go pretty quickly. Can you, let's see here. I'm going to start at the top and go pretty quickly. And again, we'll take, I want to get as many questions as we can. So you're basically going to fill out the, the first form and okay this form they didn't put up till about 11 o'clock thursday night so like on my personal facebook page i put a link to a form on wednesday it doesn't look like this it's fine if you used it the form that my wife used for her business did not look like this we used the form 
because we turned everything in Thursday and we've already been approved. So I don't think the government and banks understand you're not working with perfect information here, but this is the latest form. So if you have not yet completed it, please use this form. It's really frankly pretty simple. So even if you, if you haven't submitted anything yet, I would strongly encourage you to use this form. As you'll see there, you're gonna check at the top. You're gonna check 501c3. If you're a 501c3, there are some churches that are not 501c3. If you are a 501c3, it's gonna make your life a lot easier. And so you wanna check that. If you're not a 501c3, I've heard advice and I'm not saying these people are wrong because there's some reputable people and they said, well, I think you should check sole proprietor if you're not a 501c3. I disagree with that. That is not what a church is. You're not a sole proprietor. There's not owners. Um, I, would, I would check other because they're gonna quickly see your legal name. But again, I don't think anyone's gonna get kicked out because you checked the wrong box. But I would say if you're a 501c3, check that. If you're, if you're a church, which you can't operate, a lot of churches have been around for 50, 100 years. They never got their 501c3. They were just a religious institution. I would check other. And then under business name and address, you're gonna make it pretty clear that you're a church. Does that make sense to everyone? Tim? Yeah, that was one of our questions you just answered. So you obviously want to put the tax ID number. You should have a tax ID number for the church. And so you definitely want to put that there. Uh, for primary contact, make sure that that person is going to be going back and forth. It's typically not, unless it's a very small church. It's probably not going to be the senior minister, senior pastor. It's probably either going to be a staff person like an executive minister or a lay person like a financial secretary, treasurer, or something like that. But make sure, I assure you, the banker, the whoever's going to be writing this loan for you on behalf, or you know, on behalf of the process, they're going to have questions. So make sure you have the best person there. That frankly, my my bankers texted me at 10 o'clock at night and asked a question. So these guys are working 12, 14, 16 hour days. So it needs to be someone that will take a phone call um, or respond to an email quickly. Okay, let's go to average pay, monthly payroll. Um, I'm going to. I'm going to try to be real, real simple. I, I, I believe, and this has been my advice I've been giving to churches the last couple of weeks as I've talked to them, I would rather err on the side of being cautious and conservative and try to get my application in as quickly as possible than maybe get every single penny I can. $1,000 or $2,000 or $10,000 on the table if I, can get, if I can get this application in and I can get it in quickly. So... You basically are going to put, if you look at a, a payroll, our bank at first said they wanted 2019. So we just printed out basically everything that we were in payroll from for 2019. Then they came back and asked for first quarter of 2020. But you're either going to look at a, essentially, you could look at something different if you're a new church, but you're going to look at 12 months rolling. I would say you want to start with 2019. That's easiest. I was talking with, uh, if anybody knows Greg Marksbury down in Orlando, I was talking to his um, secretary, financial secretary last week, she said, we've had a, a decent amount of change since 2019 in the first quarter of 2020. Two people are getting paid less now. One person retired. We've hired a new person. So it's imperative. If you've had changes in 2020, you want to show that, especially if it's to your advantage to get more money. If it's to your disadvantage to get less money, you might want to show 2019 if that makes sense. But so you want to at least have the 12 months for 2019 and then the three months for, uh, for 2020, but it's only gonna be a 12 months. So when you're looking at your average payroll, you're gonna look at whatever benefits you the most, whatever your greatest amount would be, and you wanna take that, so let's say it was 350,000, or I'm sorry, 360,000 over 12 months, you're gonna divide that by 12, and so your average monthly payroll is gonna be 30,000. I'm gonna go ahead and go down this path quickly, and Tim and I have already talked about it. Um, for churches, a lot of that money is going to be in housing. I personally don't think you should include housing. Um, that's for a couple of reasons, mainly because Tim Scott, who along with Rubio wrote the legislation, has been on record saying we shouldn't be including housing. If you are working with SunTrust in Georgia and Florida, a lot of our churches have accounts with SunTrust that has merged with bb and is now becoming Truist. They've already said they're not allowing housing, so take that out. So if you look at the form, Tim, for, uh, it's your form when you do your taxes, form 941. Let me pull that up Yeah, 941. Yeah. So you if you look at, that? yeah, if you look at IRS form 941, it specifically does not include housing, okay? So that's another reason that, that I, I think that we shouldn't be including housing. But again, this is my opinion. 
It is absolutely a gray area. I get that. If you want to include housing, you can. Here's what I would say. If I end up being right and they kick it out, understand you might, you might be in the next tranche of money. So the first 349 billion might be gone by the time they kick you out, you resubmit. But I will say, I firmly believe there's gonna be more than 349 billion, okay? Firmly believe there's gonna be more than that. So, um, so if you wanna submit it with housing, you can. If you don't, then I, I would err on the side of caution and I would tell you that would be my recommendation, okay? What you're gonna do is you're gonna do whatever that number you come up with. Understand there's a max per employee of 100,000. So let's say that you chose to use housing. I doubt a lot of you are having employees making their whole package is over 100,000 if you don't include housing. But let's say you do choose to include housing. Again, not my recommendation. You're gonna choose it and let's say the salary is $80,000. Half of that's housing and half of it's um, pay. Plus they have a 403B, plus they have medical benefits. Anyway, let's say their whole package is 105,000. The max you can take is 100,000. And so I would just max them out at 100,000. Okay. Again, some people will say, well, the way it reads, and it's definitely a gray area, medical insurance is kind of in addition to the 100,000. That's not really how I read it. But again, are you really going to try to push the envelope and worry about, you know, maybe getting it kicked back and having to start this process all over again to get an extra thousand, two thousand dollars So my recommendation is you just max everyone at a hundred. If you have anyone over a hundred, I realize a lot of most churches don't have you know, more than one or two over 100, most don't have any over 100. But if you do, I would max them out at 100 and just don't put anything additional on top of that. So you're going to, whatever that number comes to for your average monthly payroll. So again, you're either going to take, say, January 1 through December 31 of 19 or April 1 through March 31 of 20. You're going to average that out, divide by 20. You're going divide, to multiply that by 2.5. Don't overthink this. It's just easy. If you can't do the simple math, do a calculator. Understand it's not always going to be 30,000 times 2.5. For my wife, I think it was $82,936 and some cents. Okay. So whatever that comes to, you put that over there. If you see, it says plus EIDL. Do you remember that very first loan that I told you about? That's out there. Churches and nonprofits can apply. Honestly, I don't think churches are going to get that, but I think if you had like a, a, a daycare, a food pantry, a school, I think it's something they should consider applying for. But I doubt any of you have applied for that yet. So just don't even think about what that means. It's not saying you shouldn't apply, but you haven't yet. And I doubt you've gotten any money. If for some reason, two churches or two entities on this call have applied for that and got some money, then you would add that into this figure over beside the dollar sign. But again, I don't think that, that shouldn't apply to any of you guys. Um, for number of employees, some people are saying put FTE. You can put FTE if you want to. I don't think it hurts you just to put the number of employees. Again, it's kind of a gray area, but I mean, it says number of employees. If you had two full-time and four part-time, I mean, it, it really doesn't matter, but you do whatever you want. If you want to use FCA, full-time, FTE, full-time equivalency, you can. If you want to put the number of employees, you do that. My wife has five full-time employees, one part-time. She just put six for that box. That's what she did. For the purpose of the loan, um, Make sure you check off all three of these things. Check off payroll, the lease, and the utilities. Check off all three of those, okay? Because you're going to want, at the end of this, this is a loan that very likely what we wanted to do and what we're expecting, and the reason it was written, is to turn into a grant. If you just check payroll there, then you can only get reimbursed for payroll. You want to make sure you're checking all three of those boxes, okay? For the application ownership, do not put that. If no one owns a church, you don't need to worry about it. Just leave it blank, okay? They're already going to know that, it, that you're a church. All these questions should be self-explanatory. They should basically be no. The only one that could possibly not be no would be number four, and maybe somehow one or two people on this call have already applied for the economic injury disaster loan, but I think that's very highly unlikely, so that's going to be no. Um, again, the questions... Uh, five through eight are almost for sure going to be no. I think number seven is number is, is probably going to be yes. And so that is important. If you have anybody for some reason that's not a resident, maybe a missionary that's come to whatever, do some work for you, but they're not a resident, they're not a, the primary residence is not USA, they cannot be included in the payroll application. It's only for USA re American citizens and residents. Okay, everybody got that? Go down to um, the next sheet. I'm trying to be done so we can take lots of questions. 
There's only one here that's going to give you real concern, and this is a gray area, and I want to be clear. There's some churches here that might feel like in good moral conscience should not be applying for this loan. Look at number two where it says current economic uncertainty. The second one where you would initial. Go down so we can see all the questions, please, Tim. Current economic uncertainty makes this loan request un makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant. This is the only one where you might find to be a gray area and in conscience you might go, you know what the truth is? Our offerings are off 30%, but we're sitting on 100,000 in our savings account and we're gonna be okay. I would say, you don't know if you're gonna be okay. You don't know how long this is gonna last, how long it's gonna linger and how bad this is gonna get. So I would say, in my opinion, I would initial that, no problem, and I would, I would sign this form. But if you had a problem signing that, then you should not submit this application. That was one of the questions we've already, that's one of the questions we've already received, Tim, so you've kind of answered it. I had a, a church planter ask me the same thing last week, where he, he said, we've got money in the bank, so should I even apply for this? But then 15 minutes later, he says, so we're talking about should we cut back hours right. to protect ourselves for the uncertainty of six months from now? And I said, that's exactly why this legislation was written. So you don't even have to have that conversation. That you're going to be able to pay everybody current amount, even if your offerings really tank for six months. Yeah. So Tim and I talked a little bit about this because he's kind of thinking as the manager of Waypoint, my wife owns her own business. So we're thinking through the small business lens. lens. This legislation, understand it was written, written to keep people employed so that they don't go file unemployment. So they're not unemployed. Instead of having 30 million people, they want to have 15 million people unemployed, which who knows what's going to happen there. But the point is, when it says ongoing operations, basically you're saying there's no way we're going to cut staff. We're going to continue making every payment. We're going to continue paying all of our staff. We're not going to ask them to go 25% pay, 50% pay. So yes, if you think we're doing good, I know a church in Illinois that's sitting on $3 million, a big church. They're sitting on $3 million. You know what? They're looking at cutting staff people. So they don't, they can't continue the ongoing operations because of their offerings. So I think in good faith, you can sign this and you can initial that. But again, that's your call. It's a judgment call. I completely understand morally, ethically, if you feel like you can't initial that. If you cannot initial all of those questions, you should not apply for this loan slash grant. Yeah. And that, there's another, I'm reading another question on the same, on the same deal as they're hesitating because it seems like we're okay. But part of this is churches aren't going to know where our giving's at for three to six months. Right. Uh, it's not in the next three weeks. Uh, and so uh, it's a loan that you can pay back if, if you're fine. Uh, and it would be ethical, it'd be morally right to, you didn't need to pay it back. But if we get surprised in three months and all of a sudden uh, your offerings go from 20% off to 80% off and you, and you decided not to apply for the loan, then I don't, at that time, you're not going to be able to reapply. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it's, yeah, if you don't get in, you know, I'm, I, I think there's going to be two or three of these tranches, but if you don't get in, you know, by May 15th, I think the chances of you getting any funding is really, if you yeah. don't get in in April, I would not plan on getting any money from this legislation. Yeah. And so the churches aren't going to know in April how we're going to be doing in right. August. August is normally bad to begin with much less look at where we are now. And so that's the purpose of this is don't lay anybody off this summer once your offerings really go bad. So, but it's a great question that several people are asking. So if you've asked a question on that, I'm just gonna hit that they've been answered live. If you've asked okay. about, should we, really, should we really apply? Someone said, well, the church is, I, I can only see, I'm in the chat room, Tim, because I'm ready for cute question and answer now. Uh, okay. So hopefully that made some sense. And I, but it says, well, the churches who use this act be held under Title IX. Basically, when I think Title IX, I think women sports and men's sports in college, because that's how it applies. But it basically means, you know, you can't um, show any bias, any uh, whatever when it comes to discrimination. discrimination, when it comes to gender issues, sexual orientation, all that kind of stuff. It's a good question. I've seen it come up. There's definitely been some lawyers that have scared some people by writing some stuff out there. Let me be clear. A couple things here. The SBA, somebody in the government had to essentially be the instrumentation to, to have this money go back and forth. They're using the SBA. The local lenders are writing these loans. Okay. The local lenders are getting a fee. 
So they're getting anywhere from 5%. If it's $350,000 or less, the local lender is getting a 5% fee paid by the government to there. The, the, the loan rate, if it ends up not being a grant and you end up having to pay interest on this, the rate's going to be 1%. And it's payable in two years. You're paying that to the lender, not to the SBA. So basically, the local lender is going through the SBA to figure all this out. The, the point is, no, you don't have to be held to Title IX. You're not, you're not compromising anything, separation church and state. Essentially, you have a separation between church and state, and that is you're, make, you're getting a loan that would might turn into a grant um, through, your local, through your local bank where you do checking where you already have a prior relationship. Understand, if this turns into a grant, the government's not sending you a check. The government will then pay off that loan to the local lender. So there's a, there's a big veil there, a curtain there, separating us, the church, not-for-profit getting money directly from the government. I feel good about this. I would also like to make it clear, this legislation, and I'm not getting political at all, okay, because I tend to be more of a moderate, but this wasn't lit, written by Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. This was written by Marco Rubio and Tim Scott, who specifically wrote it and have been proactively trying to get churches. They want to see churches help through this legislation. So this is a, this is a pro-church, pro-Christian uh, people of faith uh, piece of legislation, okay? And uh, so there were a couple of references in the questions to some articles that have been circulated over the weekend about, hey, stay away from this because then you'll be, you know, it's not separating the church and state, which number one, in and of itself, that's a whole other debate about whether that's a constitutional question to begin with. Right. Yeah. All that aside, uh, I'm going to include a link to a great article that was written uh, explaining that and how uh, churches are protected under First Amendment from the um, anti-discrimination verbiage of the government document. And so I'll include a link in that in the follow-up email that you can read that that doesn't rebut what those other articles are saying, but there's always people that are saying, oh, we shouldn't get in bed with the government. Uh, but but there is legislation on the books that protects churches uh, from having to not discriminate uh, for people again, for religious orientation, sexual orientation, things like that. We're, we're going to be protected in that arena, and this loan would, would, would fall under that protection. And I, I agree with everything you're saying there, Tim, but I just want to, be, I want to be clear. This loan is no different than if you and I went to SunTrust, got a loan for a home mortgage, and they sold that paper to the government. This, the government's backing up, like Fannie Mae, whatever, they're backing up this loan. But you, your relationship as the borrower is with your local bank that's making the loan, okay? So it is not with the SBA. It's not with the government. All right. We just had a question about uh, about where is the application. I'll include a link to that application in our follow up email here this afternoon uh, that that you can fill out. Uh, Tim's so going to include the application for the payroll protection plan. He's also going to include a link. It's thirty one pages. It comes from the Treasury website. Okay, because there's going to be a lot of people you're going to read say this, that, and, and admittedly they're gray areas. This is a work in progress at best. But the Treasury put out a 31 page document, basically Q&A, Q&A. You might read that and still think, well, that's a gray area and you would be right. What the Treasury Department said, not what I said, what Tim said, what some bureaucrat said or some some bank that you're trying to work with, you can at least refer to the Treasury website. So they'll put it out. It's long, it's 31 pages and most of it won't apply to you, but there are a few questions in there that will apply to you. Yeah, so that link will be at the follow-up email as well. Uh, if a church is not 501c3, which, believe it or not, Tim, I would, I would estimate as much as half of the churches in Virginia and Maryland that we interact with uh, regularly, there's about 530 churches in our footprint. Yeah. As many as half of them probably are not 501c3. Uh, and Virginia was one of the last states that, it, that actually uh, right. requir required it just about 10, 15 years ago. So our commonwealths, not states. Yeah, Kentucky and, so, Kentucky and Virginia tend to be the issues because of the commonwealth. Exactly. They, they were almost anti-501c3 for the longest time, yeah. That's right. So what should the trustees sign the signature of representative of applicant? Yeah, I just uh, personally don't think the trustees should sh sign as business owners. There are, there are people out there, if you might have seen the Vanderbloom and website, I think they would say the church should have the trustees sign as owners. I'm uncomfortable with that because that's not technically correct. But if you wanted to sign as owners there, I just think it's opening a can of worms saying that you own the church and then they're going to ask for your personal information. So I personally would leave that out, but I probably would somewhere include the 
the trustee's information or the trustee's names on there. I might just, you know, not include it uh, right there where it says owners. I don't like that terminology because I don't think they are the owners. All right. Uh, one question. What documents are requested by the banks to document payroll? Is that the 941? Yeah, if you have a 940, if you have a 941, which hopefully you do, that's by far the best. I want to be clear here too. I didn't go into this. You can't include independent contractors. Okay, independent contractors can actually file themselves. So if you're 1099, anyone, if you're an independent contractor, you cannot include that in your payroll. And I should have mentioned that earlier. All right, that's helpful. Uh, here, uh, two more questions here, and then we may receive even more. Uh, is it possible if we accept the dollars that we're taking money away from others who may need it more and won't get it? And so, um, here's what I think is going to happen. I mean, I, it, that's, that's possible, but unless you're going to go do the paperwork for the ones that need it more and won't get it, how are you going to know who those people are? But here's what I would say. And Marco Rubio was on uh, CNBC this morning and he fully admitted that, Hey, this was a short term solution. We started writing this a month ago. We didn't know how bad it was going to be. Um, he fully expects, and I think this is where I think even Pelosi agrees, even though they'll, anyway, I'll keep the politics aside. But anyway, I think they all agree. I think they could probably get a unanimous vote for just this. The problem will be the pork that's added into the whatever. But I think there will at least be a second, if not a third round of the SBA stuff that we're talking about, the PPP plan. And, you know, it was originally $349 billion. I think you're probably looking the next round might be 500 billion. So there's going to be quite a bit for a while. Now, that being said, if every small business, every church, every 501c3, you know, in the country applied for this, yeah, we could be talking about, you know, I don't know, a, a trillion dollars. I mean, it could be a, a lot, a whole lot. So, so there's a point at which not every, everyone might not get the money. I fully get that. If you want to be part of the first 349 billion, then you really, really, really need to get this in as soon as possible. I would say this week, if at all possible. All right. Um, so how's the money going to be forgiven versus being a loan? Can you explain pull up, that quick? Pull up the application. I don't think I went over that. Um, I all think right. it's on the application, if you can do that. Let me, uh, but here, here's how I'm going to tell you. It's going to be after June. But well, here's, here's what the, how the legislation reads, and this is a gray area, but good question. I should have covered it. After you're approved. So my wife and I found out her business was approved this morning. I don't know if that means it was really, we're going to say today's the date or it's the day that they put the money in her account. Okay. But some point, either today's date, the day she was approved or the day they put the money in her account, she's going to get $82,936. We're going to keep a record and here's how the legislation is written. And I think it's a great area. I don't think you have to be, you know, letter of the law here over the next eight weeks from the day we were approved, we have to show how much of that we spent on payroll, lease, rent, utilities, um, mortgage. Okay. But it, it says mortgage interest, just so you know, okay. Not mortgage, mortgage interest. And so um, go down a little bit, Tim, I think it might be on the application where it talks about how, how you forgive it, but it might not be, might be on some other worksheet. So I'll try to, fo I'll follow up if it's not on here. Um, okay. But anyway, so think in terms, I think it might say read here, this applicant will provide, look where you're going to initial, the applicant will provide, uh, go, go up a little bit, Tim, sorry, you went too far down on where you're initialing. The applicant will provide to the lender documentation varying showing the number of, uh, da, 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 da. and then, okay, I understand the loan forgiveness will be, will be provided for the sum of documented payroll costs, covered mortgage interest payments, not mortgage payments in full, just the interest, covered rent payments and covered utilities, not more. But then at other places and throughout the legislation, it refers to eight weeks. So from the time you get the money in your account, from the day you're approved, whatever you want, for the next eight weeks, you're going to have to prove how much of that was spent on payroll, rent, covered mortgage and interest payments, not the principal, just interest, covered utilities. But understand what it says there, not more than 25% of that can be for non-payroll costs. So let's say that, again, let's go back to my analogy, it was 360000 a year, it's 30000 a month, and you get a, you get a, a loan for $75,000. 
and let's say from let's say you get approved on April 15th then from April 15th to June 15th you show that you spent $58,000 in payroll okay well remember you got paid you got a grant a loan rather of 75,000 so three-fourths of that three-fourths of that can go to cover payroll the rest can go to cover utilities lease lease payment, mortgage interest, things like that. So at 58,000, that would be at least 75%. So you would be okay. Cause that would be at least, uh, you know, 75% of, of 75,000. But let's say you only spent $50,000 on payroll. Then you could, you could get, you could get that. And then you could get whatever 25% of 75,000 once that comes to 17,500 roughly. So you could get 50,000 of payroll, plus 17.5 forgiven. But you have to make sure that at least, because again, they're trying, the whole point of the legislation is to keep people employed, right? And so you want to make sure that at least 75% of your loan amount you spend on payroll for eight weeks. If you spend less than 75%, understand part of this will go from being a, a, a grant, what could be a grant, will, attend, will turn into a loan. Now that being said, Tim referred to this earlier, the loan is 1% over two years, okay? And no interest due for six months. So we're talking about a minimal amount of money. Let's say at the end of the day, you got $100,000 and $85,000 of it turned into a grant and the lender comes to you on July and says, hey, you still owe $15,000. Then you're paying 1% interest on the loan for two years at $15,000. So it's still not a bad deal at all for you. It's still a very good deal for you. Yeah, and that's the question I have, um, or not the comment I've had, and have already told some people, is uh, let me stop share this, and this will be the end of our webinar. Uh, if uh, I'm going to leave it open a little bit in case there's any more questions people want to type in, um, uh, even though we're, we'll be done with the, the webinar, uh, Tim can sign off. Uh, but churches are not going to know, and so you, you want to keep track of your expenses for the next eight weeks after you are approved for your loan. But your current operating uh, reserves are probably going to pay, uh, but you don't know where you're going to be three months, six months from now. So put that loan of fifty thousand dollars on in savings with CFR. They're going to pay right now one point eight percent interest uh, for ready cash, not like a three year three year CD. It's like you can get it. In a, in a day from them, and you're going to make 1.8% sitting at there waiting to see what happens with your church offerings for the next three to six months. And so you're actually going to make money waiting to see what happens because you're going to, even if it turns out into a loan rather than a grant, the interest is only a percent. And so, uh, so you're, you're almost doubling your interest money waiting to see if you're going to need it or not. So uh, that would be my advice is to, if you don't already have an account with CFR, Tim didn't say this, but I will as a good ministry partner, uh, is um, is to just to park it there and see what happens with your offerings in August and September. And because you don't want to lay anybody off in September or October, much less in May. And so hold on that money and see if you got to, if you got to, you know, uh, lean on that money for three months uh, until the church gets back to some semblance of, of normal. All right, well, our time is up. We are really glad that you've joined us. We've had great participation with questions. Tim, thanks for uh, uh, your work and uh, for CFR being great partners trying to help churches financially. Uh, and so, um, so you're a great, uh, great resource for that. And so I'll, I'll include Tim's email in the follow-up uh, email as well. If you have any specific questions for him or CFR, yeah how to set up a, a, a line of line, a line that you can put the money in if you need it or whatever. Uh, but um, this is going to continue to evolve over the next two, three days until it all gets sorted out. But it looks like we're getting pretty close to understanding how it works. Yeah. Most of the big banks are putting these through now. A lot of community banks are already doing it. SunTrust and BBT had said that they were probably going to be April 10th and uh, SunTrust went online this morning. So I assume BBT is online. So I think, I think even the banks that Friday were saying, we're not there yet or, or getting there now. So I think you should be good to start, start pushing, but you do have to work through where you have a relationship, local bank where you do your checking savings. That's where you need to be working through first. If, if you can't get anywhere, then we'll try to go down a different path. But, but really the SBA administrators made it clear. You need to have a prior working relationship 
in order to do this. So go to your local bank first, okay? All right. Well, Tim, thanks for your time this afternoon, uh, sharing this really useful information with us and being a ministry partner in our region, helping churches. Thank you who have attended today for this pop-up webinar. We're over 35 minutes, but this is pretty important information. We have our normal monthly webinar for ministry leaders uh, tonight at 8 o'clock about uh, politics of the local church. And uh, so uh, that's at 8 o'clock, and you can go to our Facebook page or our website to, to register for that if you haven't received email about that. But you can also stay tuned for other pop-up webinars that are starting to happen almost once a week as really timely, relevant information needs to be shared with ministry leaders like you. We're going to try and make that available to you. So thanks for your time, and I'll work on the follow-up email here right as we speak. But uh, have a great afternoon, everybody. And thanks, Tim. Thank you, guys.